I'm joined now by Steve Kaplan. Steve, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, Steve is a digital artist and author. Could you tell us a little bit about the work that you do and perhaps show us some of the projects? Sure. Uh, I uh, do, I'm a freelance digital illustrator, so I do satirical photo montage illustrations for newspapers and magazines. Mm -hmm. Is that something I've been doing since 1989, which is a frighteningly long time ago, <laughs> before Photoshop, in fact. So wow. I started with Photoshop. How was that even possible before Photoshop? It was very <laughs> tricky. In fact, for the first three versions of Photoshop, there was no there was no separate layers. Yeah. I remember when layers were introduced into Photoshop. Yeah. It was the same week as my second son was born, and I was thinking, I don't know which one's going to have a bigger impact in my life, <laughs> and I'm still trying to decide. Photoshop, surely. <laughs> I think possibly Photoshop. <laughs> I hope he's not watching this. <laughs> so can you show us um, some of the work that you've produced recently? And Certainly. Uh, this was an illustration that I did recently for The Guardian, and it's uh, Michael Gove, who was then the Education Secretary. Uh, if I zoom in on this, uh, pouring a bunch of... Uh, so individual teachers, there, that's hey. right, and he's tipping them out of this bucket into this uh, educational mincing machine <laughs> um, and they're stuck in this school and then they come out the other end as, oh uh, as sort of identical <laughs> uh, teachers. Processed, processed uh, teachers out the end. Processed right? teachers out the end. It's about how he wanted to stamp out the individualism of, right. uh, of teaching. Right, right. Okay, brilliant. Um, this one was uh, an <laughs> illustration for uh, Radio Times, and it was about how Top Gear would look if it were presented by women. <laughs> and it's nice to have a bit of fun with this and get a few details in. So the uh, tattoo on Jeremy, or perhaps Jemima Clarkson, yeah. reads Top Gear translated into Chinese. Thank you for Google for that Very one. Very good. <laughs> little Ferrari necklace that uh, Hammond is wearing. I, I rather love that, actually. <laughs> it's rather cool, isn't yeah. it? You like that one? Um, and uh, uh, May looking, I don't know why he just seemed to need curlers and... Uh, and uh, he, well, he's he's half happening. ready for the show though. He's <laughs> half ready, but he always is half yeah, ready anyway. he's a bit scruffy. Okay, excellent, that's great. Uh, this was for um, a, a Christmas card for the Italian news magazine Internazionale and it's Obama as Father Christmas. I think that kind of speaks for itself. It was surprisingly tricky to put this one together to make the view through the glasses work. So you get this yeah. like, distortion of the way the glasses, you know, d uh, refract the view seen through them and then getting his face to blend into the beard and, and everything. And the beard, I mean, is that something that you had to draw individual strands of hair? On um, I had to cut out individual strands of hair, yes, to wow. make those fit. And in fact, quite a few of them are drawn. So how long did that particular image take you to produce? Oh, about an hour. Oh, really? Is that well, all? I oh, gosh, it looks like much... Yeah, you certainly Because do. the newspapers, they will phone yeah. up at 2 o'clock and yeah. won't finish artwork by 5 o'clock. Right, right. Okay. And the shortest deadline I ever had was for the Independent, for the front page illustration. I had 45 minutes for that. Oh, one. wow. Okay. And it ended up with them phoning me up saying, is it ready? I said, I need 10 more minutes. And they said, you can have 5 more minutes. So um, you really rely on our software performing quickly for you, right? Well, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> Not only that, but of course, I know all the keyboard shortcuts, yeah. which you have to do. Yeah. But also, I write a lot of my own keyboard shortcuts and I yeah. write a lot of actions which will speed up things that I do repetitively. I was going to ask you about actions actually because they can really make a massive difference. They make a they, huge things. difference yeah. and certainly when I see people sitting there doing the same task over and over I think you don't need to do it. Yeah. Do it once, yeah. record it and then you can re retrieve the whole thing with a keystroke. Absolutely, absolutely. And do you tend to personalise your workspace as well and kind of save lots of presets and that sort of thing? When you I work? do. I have two main workspaces, one for regular Photoshop editing and one for 3D. Yeah. And with things like 3D, I just like to have the palettes, the panels set up the way that I want them. Yeah. 
and uh, and I'd like to work with like a CMYK colour picker because most of my work is for print. Those yeah. kind of things. And you just evolve, you know, your favourite sets of brushes, your favourite tool shortcuts, yeah. all those kind of things. Yeah. Absolutely. So I guess the uh, the new libraries panel that's just come out recently where you can access all of this from everywhere is going to be huge. The new important. libraries panel is great. Yeah. I really like yeah. it. Yeah. And I particularly like the fact that it ties in so well with mobile applications. Yes, absolutely. So um, I, can, I can be out and see uh, something that I like the shape of, mm. photograph it with the, the, the shapes tool, yeah. it'll convert it into, uh, into a vector object and then it'll yeah. appear there for me in Photoshop. Yeah. It's fantastic. Isn't it exciting? Yeah. How it's very so exciting. Yeah. It's Great. really exciting. Um, have you got some more projects to show? Um, just a, a, a couple. This was a, a retouching job I did recently for uh, Reader's Digest magazine. It was a cover of Gillian Anderson. Yeah. And they just wanted her sort of cleaned up slightly. And this is the, the result. What's interesting about this is that it was quite important to maintain her as a woman in her 50s, not yeah. try and make her look too glamorous. So yeah, it's very tricky, isn't it, getting the right level of retouching. Obviously, this sort of thing is in the news a lot. We've, exactly. we've sort of talked about it with a lot of different photographers who do this sort of work. And people will say, oh, no, no, you can't use Photoshop to retouch people because that's yeah. tinkering with nature. Yeah. Before I came on here, I had some makeup put on. Uh, you've been Photoshopped that's tinker in real life. That was tinkering with nature. And Steve, I'm you looked wonderful life. before there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not used to wearing makeup. It feels odd, doesn't it? <laughs> I guess you're used I, to this I, stuff. I, I am a little yeah. bit, yeah. <laughs> I feel like my so, face is cracking. So what sort of level are you um, prepared to retouch images to? Are you prepared to change shapes of, of bodies and that sort of thing? Or is it very much Most of the work I do is satirical. Right, right. Um, and so I would go to ridiculous lengths. Right. Um, for my own holiday photographs yes. and family photographs, yes. I had this thing until recently thinking, actually, I shouldn't retouch them at all because... Yeah. I'm messing with my own history. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I was in, on holiday recently in Istanbul at a fish mm. restaurant and the waiter bought this magnificent tray of fish out and I mm. photographed it. Yeah. And when I got it back home, it was just a tray of dead fish. <laughs> and I thought, actually, what I want to do is to make this Recreate the more like it of felt. That. Yeah, yeah. So I used Camera Raw in yeah. there to, uh, to enhance it. Yeah. Um, and so I think from that point of view, retouching as much as you like mm. is okay if mm. it's recapturing the memory of what the event felt like yeah. rather than so much what it And I think like. also in real life, I mean, things are in 3D, so they have a different feeling and a different kind of exactly. dynamic to them, exactly. really, don't they? Rather than something that's a flat. And you have to make things stand out. Mm. So, you know, if when you're in a restaurant, you're looking at something, that's what you're focusing on. Yeah. In a photograph, you can see the packet of cigarettes on the next table. You yeah. can see that the people arguing in the background. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you dim all those out so it brings your attention in, that yeah. helps you to recapture the scene. Yeah. So, no, I'm all in favour of, of Touching. I think it's a Actually, thing. I find Lightroom Mobile, even the algorithms now for the automatic kind of um, settings, mm. just one button click to enhance the levels and that sort of thing. It's a yes. really fantastic job to start with. Do you work with Lightroom Mobile at all? I do to a very small extent, yeah. but I prefer to get my images back to my desktop yeah. on a 27 inch monitor right. and where I can actually get, see what I'm doing. Get cracking I've, straight away. I've there. tried editing uh, images on my iPhone and frankly, the screen just yeah. isn't big enough. Sure, maybe Having a tablet's said that, better. Well, yeah. there are some great apps. I mean, Photoshop Touch is excellent. Photoshop yeah. Mix, which yeah. I've been playing with uh, recently, it's fantastic. Yeah. You can do pretty much instant cutouts of objects, you yeah. can put them onto backgrounds, the whole interface, the way that you move between layers and you scale things by dragging them, it is so yeah. clever, so intuitive. It is, and it's got the power of the Adobe servers with the content to wear fill and also the straightening tool in there as yeah, well, hasn't I'm it? So it's really... Seriously uh, Our apps are seriously powerful, aren't they? <laughs> so they are seriously powerful, and what's good is that, uh, that the mobile apps are not attempting, attempting to replicate yeah. the whole Photoshop experience, yeah. but they're giving you a very workable set of tools that you can actually use to, uh, to, to, to make mobile things happen. Yeah, fantastic. You obviously have been working with the Creative Cloud for some time now. What, I have. What have been the benefits? benefits to you and what you do? When um, the Creative Cloud was first uh, introduced by Adobe, a lot of people got quite upset about the subscription model. They mm -hmm. said, no, I like to own my software. Yeah. Why should I be paying for it? Yeah. Um, the benefit, the chief benefit of the subscription is that it's updated all the time. Mm -hmm. Every couple of months, new features come out. There are new tools there. There are things I can do this month that I couldn't do two months ago. Mm. Um, particularly recent things like the path blur, mm. the uh, the spin blur. I don't know, okay, most people who, who create um, 
maybe satirical photo montage, but most kind of photo montage of Photoshop. Yeah. They want to do things like having a car driving, so they want to make the, the wheel spin around. Yeah, all these compositing all uh, tools things. are really yeah. important, aren't they? Yeah. Previously, that was a real pig of a job to do. You had the radial blur filter, but it was only uh, perfectly circular. It was yeah. very hard to control. Yeah. Um, it meant working with multiple layers, taking things apart, joining them back together. Yeah. Now you can do it all in one shot, and it just works so smoothly. So those updates, they're great. They, yeah. They're a great reason yeah. for, for subscribing. It, it just works for me. So you've pulled out some of these key features that you use on a regular basis since the launch of the Creative Cloud. I think the path blur and the radial blur are amongst them, right? Absolutely, yes. Would you like to show us some of them in action now? Absolutely. Well, let's start with this image of a roulette wheel. And I want to make the roulette wheel spin. This is the kind of task that would have been so hard to do six months ago. Yeah. This would have been a major process of taking off the, the, the wheel, distorting it till it makes a square, spinning it, trying to distort it back again. Yeah. It would have been horrible. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to take this, it's only a single layer, and I'm going to turn it into a smart object. Yes, because we want to keep everything non-destructive these days, don't we? We want to keep everything non-destructive, but also with a smart object, then we can selectively apply the filter afterwards. Yeah. That's really clever. Great. So I'm going to go to Filter and Blur Gallery, and I'm going to choose Spin Blur. And here's the default. You get this little spin coming out right in the middle there. Well, we can drag that to move it where we want. And that's pretty good in itself. What we can also do is grab the side handles and not only change it so it's an ellipse rather than just a, a pure circle, as it would have been before, but we can actually change it to, uh, to work on the tilt, we can have it pretty much any shape we want. So I can pull this right out so that it matches the shape of the roulette wheel. And this sort of in context on, um, on screen editing that you're doing there within the stage itself is, is really, it makes this sort of thing a lot easier, doesn't it? Very, very much so, yes. Absolutely. Um, and you've got this head-up display, so you can drag this around and I can decide exactly how much I want to spin this, so I can give it, that's quite a nice amount of spin all the way over there. Let's take this off for now. So we've got this nice smooth spin. It's not rotating around the, the centre of the wheel, so we can actually drag this up. If I hold down the Alt key as I drag it, and I can move the centre of this spin. And that is a very, very nice thing to be able to do. And then you can also add this strobe effect, so you can get a few of the uh, uh, iterations of, of the spinning wheel coming in there. So this is adding the effect that the camera would naturally have. Exactly, exactly, yes. And th actually, that's not bad. Let's get rid of that one. And I'm going to apply that. Let's say, go ahead and let's apply that to the image. And then this is going to save this back into it, and there it is. Now, we don't want the handle in the middle yeah. to be blurred, of course. Yeah, yeah. Because it's a smart object, Every filter you apply has a built-in mask. Mm -hmm. And the mask masks not the layer, but the effect, mm -hmm. but the filter. Mm -hmm. So we can go for our brush tool, and I can paint over that central column. Let's go for more of a, uh, a soft brush. And when I'm painting in black on here, that's hiding the effect. And if I go a bit too far, as I did over the edge there, well, I can just swap over, paint in white to reveal it again. And there, in a few seconds... So fast. It's it? something that would have taken an hour to do yeah. with, a, with a, a previous version of Photoshop. So this, this is fantastic. It's a huge benefit. Not something you want to do every day, but when you do, yeah. It makes it so much You're easier. You're really going to save the time yeah. there. Fantastic. And so there's another uh, blur effect, isn't there, as well, that you've selected? There is. Uh, the path blur, which I, uh, which I really like. So let me just open up this, uh, this image. So here is a very, very simple composite. We've got this saxophone player, and uh, he's just plonked onto a, a different background. And as it stands, well, he doesn't look like he belongs in this background, but also he's very static. There's no sense of music coming from yeah, this. Yeah. So the first thing I'm going to want to do here is to make him blend into that background. So I'm going to go to Image Adjustments, and I'm going to go for this one that people don't use very often, which is Match Colour. Great. 
it can be a little tricky to get your head around, but actually this one works by making the, the tones of one layer match the tones of another layer. So the target is the sax layer, that's good. The source, we're going to make the same document, and we can choose the background layer. Oh, fantastic. So you can even go to a different Photoshop document you've got, that you've got over. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And you get this rather extreme effect. Well, we can take the luminance and the colour intensity down somewhat, and then we can fade the effect. And if we go somewhere like this, you can see that's not bad. You know, it's still very clearly the same guy, but that's how it was before. If I take the preview off, and when this is on, it just makes him match that background. It's adding so the lighting in there, isn't exactly. it, to him? Yeah, fantastic. So already he feels more like he's part of this image. Yeah. So now... Make him move. <laughs> let's make him move. Well, let's make him into a smart object again, because yeah. uh, that lets us edit this later. So let's go into Filter, Blur Gallery, and choose a Path Blur. And here's the default, this little uh, horizontal blur. And what I want to do is actually move this out just over the saxophone so that we get a bit of a curved blur on there. That's quite good, it's giving us some movement in it. And we can grab this end and let's have that change the speed of that so you get a bit more motion. Yeah, so it's exactly what it says on the tin, you are drawing the path that the saxophone would have exactly. just taken. Exactly. Yeah. Now we want the, the blur on the sax, I like that, but I don't want all that blur on him. So what we can do is draw another path behind the saxophone. And on here, I can set the speed to zero, and that takes the blur off him entirely. So you're using a combination there of the of the kind of the widget-based editing and and the um, sliders on the uh, panel there. To That's right, I'm, and I'm using the uh, using two separate paths in here. Yeah. One for the saxophone, and the second one limits the effect. So um, now I can just say, okay, let's have a look at that on our image, and it's rendering that back into the image and there's our effect we've got this nice blur going on on the saxophone but he is left largely unblurred so we've gone from there to there in yeah. a very short space of time and because it's a smart object we're going to any time double click it it's going to open it back up in that blur gallery exactly as we left it and now we can change it we can add a, a, a strobe effect to this if we want to make that saxophone judder a bit more. And we, because it's a smart object, we can always go back and yeah. edit our results, change our mind later. Yeah. Fantastic. And I mean, to do this in the past before the path blur, what sort of process would you have had? I would have duplicated the layer. I would have applied a radial blur without seeing what we were doing, just yeah. with this, this tiny little thumbnail preview, yeah, yeah. and then use a complex series of layer masks yeah. to, to make the two layers blend together. Well, I'm so glad this we brought great. this effect out for you. <laughs> so am I. It's because you can do spectacular things in an instant. Absolutely. So, so that's an example of compositing there. So there's another effect that you um, have selected as well for compositing, uh, which is the perspective warp. Is perspective right? warp filter. I love this is, warp. It's great, isn't it? Really yeah. good. I'll point out, before we go on, it doesn't work with everything. It works mainly with boxy objects. Yes, something that you can easily select the planes exactly. around. Yeah. So I'm going to try that on um, this image here. So it's a bus on a London street, and that, that's really all it is. And with to move the bus around, there it is. You can see it's a separate layer. The trouble is... It's on the wrong angle to fit this. Route. Yeah, buses aren't allowed on the pavement, Steve, are they? And um, buses aren't allowed on the pavement. You've noticed that as well. <laughs> yeah. um, so to make this fit in, again, previously, it would have meant dividing the bus into two halves, the, the, the front and the side, and then distorting each one. The trouble is when you distort each one independently... Joining them the is difficult. Right. Because the perspective moves elements around on that yeah. join, and, that, and that's hard to work with. The first thing I'm going to do, though, is just to lower the uh, saturation a bit, just to make it look a bit more in keeping. Look with a, bit this grubbier. Rather drab. <laughs> a bit grubbier, but also a bit more in keeping with, uh, with the street that we're yeah. on. That's yeah. a bit better. So I'm going to go into Edit and choose Perspective Warp. Um, and this is a really nice tool. So you start by drawing a rectangle over the, the, the front of the bust. I'm going to go for that corner there. 
And all we need to do is to make this more or less follow the perspective of the bus itself. And that really helps because it just means the perspective of the, uh, of the box will match the bus and it'll get uh, uh, much better results this way. Um, there's the first one. If I now start at the back and draw another plane, it'll be for the side of the bus, and you can see when I get close, those two lines change to blue. That means they're going to snap together. And the same thing again. I'm going to adjust these handles, partly so that we get the, uh, the, the lines matching the perspective of the bus, but also so we get the vertical at the back matching the vertical of the, the pole at the back of the bus, like this. And that's it. That's all it takes to define the perspective of this bus. We can now click on the warp button, like this. And if I hold the shift key down and click on uh, any of these verticals, it'll constrain it to being a true vertical. Right. What we can now do is, well, we can move this bus up and down. And I can grab one of these back handles and I can bring that back in just like this. And I can grab the front one and bring that out to make it wider. And let's make this match the perspective of the street. And it really is just as easy as that. It does such a great job, doesn't it? And we can it's start like magic. It's it like is magic. that Photoshop magic yeah. in action, really, isn't it? And when we take the lamppost that I'd cut out earlier and bring them to the front, you know, there is that bus rather neatly fitting onto this straight. And again, doing in seconds yeah. what would have been a very difficult job before. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. So what else have you got to show us? Lots of good stuff. <laughs> These are all my favourite things that, uh, that are showing up in Photoshop now. So um, automatically selecting um, a focus range. So here's a photograph of a bear. Um, and it's been photographed against this, uh, I don't know what kind of background, is that a, is that a beach? Yeah, Maybe and the, the tones are very similar to his nose, aren't they? So actually difficult creating a mask there, it is quite difficult. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's got a sort of fuzzy edge with the fur as well, so that's quite hard to select. If we now go to select and focus area, what it's going to do is to look at this image, find the in-focus areas, find everything that's out of focus, It'll see that as being the background, and yeah. there we go. And that's all it takes. <laughs> that's stunningly good job. <laughs> we can save that to a layer mask, or we can then go into uh, Refine Edge, and then we can go over the, uh, the fur, and it'll blend that in you know, much more neatly with that background. If we upload this to a layer mask, then it's going to come down to there's our bear on his new background. Great. So the refine edge looks at the kind of the areas where lines should be softer, puts a little bit of exactly. feathering around that, doesn't it? It's around the mask. It's particularly good for dealing with fur. Yes. And hair. Yes. Because it distinguishes between hair and yeah. background. I have no idea how and it I, does and that. And I think animals and people are the, probably the things that are lifted out from their background for compositing more than anything Absolutely, else, I imagine. More than so. anything. Yeah. Um, let me show you one more example of, of this one because it's worth having a look at. So here's another uh, picture of this woman lying down on a, uh, on a grassy background, and you can see that the background there is out of focus. Yeah. Once again, we can do select focus area. Now, this is a slightly more complex uh, image because we've got the foreground out of focus here as well as the background. But you can see it's taken out all that background. It's even taken out inside her leg. Well, we can just paint over this foreground, just very roughly to say we want to keep that as part of the image. Fantastic. We can go over her hair to say, uh, you know, that's uh, just a bit soft, it's, it should be in focus there. And it's taken in a bit of extra background where we can just drag over that to get rid of it. Okay. And, uh, and there it is. And once again, if we wanted to, we're going to a fine edge to tidy that up. But it's made this cutout simply because there was an out of focus background. Yeah, so it's looking at the uh, uh, detail within the pixels, the sharpness of the actual pixels exactly. themselves, right? Exactly. Okay. Great. It's glorious. Some really time-saving features there. Uh, have you got anything else to show us? Yes. Great. <laughs> so here is a photograph of uh, Wilmington-on-Sea, and it's an okay scene. 
uh, it's, it's got all the buildings there, but you've not only got the lights inside the, the buildings, uh, you've got all the bright lights of the museum. And I thought, wouldn't it look nice if this was a night scene? You've got reflection there on the, on the ground, which you wouldn't have on the concrete of the pavement and the road and that sort of thing. Exactly, all, all that kind of stuff. So let's see if we can turn this from a day scene into a night scene. Now, this would be normally, I mean, certainly doable, but quite a fiddly job. We'd have to select all the windows individually. Yeah. Now, we can go to select uh, color range and as well as being able to select uh, different colors or skin tones you can now select just mid-tones, highlights and shadows. So I'm going to select the shadows and let's have a quick mask preview yeah. and you can see the, the areas without a red overlay are the selected areas mm -hmm. and we can increase the range of this and you can see that's now creeping you know, across the ground and that actually looks quite good. So I'm going to load that as a selection. We've got marching ants all over the place, a ridiculously <laughs> big selection. What we can do is make a new adjustment layer. And adjustment layers, of course, mean you can change your mind yes. later. And with any adjustment layer, once you have a selection active, it will use that selection as a mask. So we can now darken up that background. Let's switch to our blue channel and add a little bit of blue in there to make it look more like a nighttime scene. And there's our instant night. Now, you can say, okay, it's not perfect, um, but because it's working with this mask, we can easily switch to the brush tool and we can paint the effect back in, in the areas where it was missing. Yeah. So we could take out that shine on the, uh, on the pavement there. Or we could say, let's have some light spilling out in front of this doorway and we can paint some light coming out of there as well. So because uh, it's an adjustment layer, we can easily manipulate it. But what we've done here, again, in just a few seconds, is to turn this from a daytime shot into a nighttime shot, simply because we're able to select those shadows automatically. Yeah, isn't it great that you're not having to spend all of this time on the painstaking, boring side exactly. <laughs> of compositing exactly. now? And more and more, Photoshop is giving you a do what I mean button. Yeah, yeah. And it's, that's what we really It's doing mean. some of the intelligent work for you, isn't it? And it's doing some of the drudge for yeah. you, yeah. And you can focus that's on right. the creative side. Exactly. Great, so what's up next? Uh, camera Raw. Camera Raw is a fantastic way of editing, as the name implies, raw images. Mm -hmm. And you've always been able to use it on JPEG images as well, yeah. but you have to open them as raw from within Photoshop, and it's been rather mm -hmm. clumsy. Now you can call Camera Raw as a regular filter on yeah. any image or any single layer, which is yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And, um, it, and it works as a smart filter. And it works as a yeah. smart filter as well, but it gives you this huge range of options. And one really clever new tool is in the lens correction. Feature. So this is a yeah. photograph of the City Hall in Oslo that I photographed when I was there earlier this year. And it's taken at an angle, and wouldn't it be nice if all those verticals were straightened up? We can go into the Lens Correction section, click on the vertical, and there we go. And how, lo how long would it have taken to do that manually? Yeah. Rotating, distorting, keystoning. Yeah. And it does it in a second. Fantastic, that's so fast, isn't it? It's, it's really, really fast. And of course, because it's part of Camera Raw, you can apply a whole range of adjustments mm. and you can modify them all independently before then committing it back yeah. into your image. And of course, the straightening function of Camera Raw is also, as we mentioned, within Photoshop Mix as well, which would be too high a processing power to happen actually on your mobile exactly. device. But that information is done via the Adobe servers and the synchronizing all happens via the Creative Cloud. It's worth cloud. pointing out that although it's done by the servers, you're not aware of images going yeah. backwards and forwards. It happens very, very fast indeed. Steve, thank you very much for showing us those tips and uh, features there. They're really, really useful things. So also, Steve's going to be joining us in the Design Web and Publishing Show to show us some of the Photoshop 3D features in action, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in the meantime, though, can you give us a little bit of uh, advice for those who are starting out in the industry as to how to get on in their careers? The most important thing, I think, is to get as much work published as you possibly can. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it's in a, in a parish circular, in a local magazine, in a local newspaper, or even on the web. But when you go and approach a design editor, uh, an art editor in a magazine or a newspaper, and they, they need to know whether to trust you, they need to know 
not is this person's work revolutionary, is it groundbreaking, is it exciting, is it modern? Mm -hmm. They need to know, can this person meet a brief yeah. and can they deliver on time? Yeah. The deadline is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. You could be the most inspired artist in the world, but if you miss the deadline, you may as well not exist. Okay, that's really, yeah. really good advice. And what about having a presence on things like Behance, having a digital creative profile out there? I think those are becoming more and more important, yes. Mm -hmm. And Behance is certainly a very good way of sharing your work, okay. not with the world, but with the creative world. Mm -hmm. So what you get with Behance is other creatives commenting on the work that you're doing, and that can you've got to be good at taking criticism because yeah. not all the comments are going to be good, yeah. but that can help you to develop yeah. and also help you to get your work out there. Yeah. So certainly, get on Behance. Also, you know, every designer, every artist, every photographer should have their own website. Mm. And if they don't, it's like they don't exist. Yeah. So yeah. it is so easy these days to, to build your website. Mm. It's essential. And for those of you who do have Creative Cloud membership, uh, you've actually got ProSite as part of your account for free. So that's a, a nice templated site which works with your Behance profile. So if you produce projects, you can easily then push them out to your ProSite and you've got more ability to customise that and make it look like a professional site. So do definitely look into that. And I think a good thing about, uh, about that is a lot of guys putting their websites together obsess over the look and feel and trying to make it different and modern and exciting. And if you are promoting yourself as a web designer, then absolutely, that's what you should be doing. Yeah. If you're promoting yourself as a photographer or an illustrator, yeah. then it's frankly, it's the work. That it's the work, yeah. And, and just pick a template, mm -hmm. one that suits your style, yeah. but it, your work absolutely has to be foreground. Yeah. Great advice there, thank you so much. Um, just one last thing, what do you think has been the secret to your success in the industry? Oh, working fast. Right, yeah. Um, and always saying yes, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, when I get um, two kinds of phone call, I get phone calls where people call me up and they say, I've got a simple job for you, which are always, without question, the most difficult jobs. <laughs> Yeah. Most challenging, most, most challenging. difficult, most time consuming. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And sometimes the phone will ring and someone will say, I've got a very interesting job for you. And those are often the cases where I'll put the phone down and I'll think, how on earth am I going to do this? But without exception, those always produce the best work of the year. Yeah. So go for the difficult jobs because those are the ones that stretch you, that make you think in a different way and that yeah. ultimately produce the more interesting work. Steve, thank you so much for all your words of wisdom, your tips and also the great features that you've shown us. We really appreciate your time. It's been a real pleasure, Iona. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. We really want to hear your thoughts about all you've seen so far, so do get in touch via Twitter using the hashtag CreateNow. want to hear from you so take part in our Twitter competition by sending in a creative tweet to tell us about your top creative cloud features. Our Adobe panel of judges will select their favourite tweet from each Northern European country, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland and the UK. The winners will receive a 12 month membership to the creative cloud. But not only that, the overall tweet from all the regions will win a Microsoft Surface Pro 3. So get posting your tweets using the hashtag create now. The competition is open from midday on the 10th of November till midnight on the 13th of November. And you can see full details, terms and conditions at this URL. Good luck. Do get your competition tweets in and your comments using the hashtag create now. A big thank you to you for joining me for the Digital Imaging Show and a massive thank you to the creative professionals who have shared their work, their tips and their creative insights with us. If you're interested in sharing the work you've produced using the Creative Cloud, then do get in touch with me via Twitter at Creative Sneaks. That's all we've got time for now, but we've got plenty more inspiration, tips and creative insights for you in the Design Web and Publishing Show and the Video and Motion Graphics Shows. Here are the details.